Uh, hello everyone, I guess uh, we're going to uh, get, get started now. Can you find your attention please? Uh, okay, uh, yeah. thank you everyone. Um, I guess we're going to get started. Uh, I know it's a Thursday night, uh, it is perhaps uh, not the top of night for lunch, so I appreciate all of you coming and complimenting that. Coming. Um, I am going to speak, as you all know, about uh, the development of a carbon trading platform in the Gulf region. And uh, I'm going to make what I think are some minor statements, rather than controversial statements, but I would like you to uh, call me on that. And I'll open up the floor for questions and answers at the end. And uh, please don't be criticizing me, attacking me, or doing or whatnot. And I'm very happy to uh, respond in kind and uh, go from there. Um, now, I am a research fellow at the Dubai, uh, Dubai Initiative at Harvard Kennedy School, and I've uh, worked for several years in the oil and gas uh, field. And um, I am framing my argument in terms of the development of a carbon trading platform, not from an environmental standpoint, because actually I'm really not that green. Uh, I'm sure most people, most people talk that green, first of all, but I mean, in terms of ideologically speaking, I'm not really that green. Um, I am looking at this more from the perspective of being able to lower energy demand in a region that has uh, quite a significant energy shortages. So I think that development of carbon mitigation strategy is one of the best ways to, to deal with this uh, shortage that the region is going through. So I, I don't want to draw you in, 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 in figures and graphs and so on. So I just have a few slides. Okay? But I mean, most of you are already aware of this. But uh, the Gulf region, of course, has the largest natural gas reserves in the world. We know that Qatar is the most dominant uh, in the GCC. Uh, Iran has more, but uh, within the GCC region, Qatar uh, has about 900 uh, trillion feet. Saudi, which is number one. Uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, which is the world's fourth largest, uh, which is the GCC's second largest. And then uh, we have the UAE, which is the world's fifth largest, uh, but the third. And then Kuwait comes in at uh, the world's uh, 20th uh, largest uh, natural gas reserves. Now, uh, the natural gas reserves across the Gulf are about 23%, and, uh, but there are little rates of utilization. So in terms of production, production is very low or limited. Uh, it's only about 8%. So obviously, the region is not living up to its potential in terms of natural gas production, and hence the reason that there are many gas shortages uh, across the GCC. Uh, now, in terms of power demand, uh, power demand is really important to, to get uh, to really understand in terms of the, the energy crisis because uh, the GCC right now is, uh, is basically needs to increase its uh, power generation, its power capacity by about 60 gigawatts of additional power between uh, 2010 and 2015, and this represents about 80 percent of current capacity and demand growth uh, over basically the past decade, but especially for about 2007, uh, a year before the financial crisis, and actually uh, the peak of uh, demand, uh, power demand within the Gulf, uh, reached about 7.7% uh, of annual growth. And we also estimate that these rates will continue until about uh, 2015. Now, this is the fastest year of growth in the world, and uh, in order to combat this, GCC members have, um, have pledged to uh, invest enormous sums of money in order to build up their, uh, their, their capacity in the power sector. So basically between $160 billion and $200 billion over the next several years. And this uh, demand is unlikely to slow. Uh, we would think that we were facing the global economic crisis uh, because uh, global demand has slowed and so on so forth and the Gulf has experienced a bit of uh, an economic slowdown. Uh, actually, that's not the case simply because uh, in order to respond to this economic crisis, the Gulf countries have, uh, most of them, have, uh, have announced their uh, economic stimulus plans. Okay, so these economic, economic stimulus plans are actually going to be the driver of continued uh, power and, uh, and natural gas demand over the next several years, where the, the, the commercial sector may have uh, fallen off the commercial demand. Now, just to give a, a, a graphic representation of, uh, of the organic link uh, between that demographics and the energy demand, we can see taking the UAE as a model, so we can see with, um, with the extreme increase in population in UAE, in about uh, 1990 outward, uh, and then we compare that actually to the increase, nearly vertical increase in uh, electricity demand over the same time period. So this is uh, very important to remember that whenever there is a uh, demographic boom, at the same time there is an increase in power demand. So this is what occurs in UAE, and this is also why many of the northern immigrants are going through uh, deal with that uh, because there is uh, a lot of gas that's coming through the Dolphin natural gas pipeline from Punta. But 
if that gas were not coming through, then it's quite likely that they would have had blackouts around 2007 as well. And actually, they did have one minor blackout in 2007. I'm not sure if, if, if you remember that, but I think it was for about two days or so. Okay, but that was around the same time that Belgian gas came online and uh, basically saved, uh, saved the bay, more or less. Now, since the 1973 uh, oil price revolution, okay, with the oil market, this I call this the oil price revolution because that was the time when uh, the international price of oil quadrupled in about a period of about two weeks. This occurred in 1973. So then, from that period onward, the region transformed itself uh, from a, a group of relatively impoverished developing nations uh, into a group of extremely wealthy countries uh, with uh, per capita GDP uh, on the scale of many of Western countries. And uh, they institute their rapid modernization, industrialization uh, at, this, at this time here. Now, the revenues that were garnered from the international sales of oil and gas uh, transformed these countries into uh, a platform of uh, frenetic uh, industrial activities, uh, linking, to the, linking together many varied uh, sectors, uh, such as uh, military, economic, industrial, uh, construction sector, tourism, to name just a few. Uh, so, because of this breakneck industrialization that occurred, and then this was thereby uh, expanded uh, from about 2001 into 2008. And uh, yeah, the reason why it, uh, this industrialization actually increased, the tempo increase, uh, was because of the second oil price revolution, okay, which occurred in 2001, which was the incremental rise of the price of oil, as we know, from the global price of oil until about 2008, where it reached a peak of about $147, I believe, per barrel during July of 2008. So this has caused massive revenue inflows into the region, which sparked off a second industrialization phase, uh, which of course put enormous pressure on uh, their energy reserves, and uh, in particular on their natural gas uh, reserves as well. Uh, so we start to see around 2006 and 2007, that's when most of the countries are not, their production rates were not able to keep up with their demand rates. So this is a period of time when you hear about the energy shortage in the Gulf, <coughs> it's this period of time from 2006 into 2007, that's when their industrialization started to keep up, or actually started to place too many uh, demands uh, on the energy sector, and they, the countries were not able to keep up with it. And the industrialization policy that many of the countries had, uh, because they want to diversify their economies and so on and so forth, uh, this exposed some weaknesses in many of their policies. And um, the most notable was uh, these energy shortages that I mentioned. That in fact, every country except for Qatar, Qatar. And uh, as of yet, there has been no regional coherent, rational strategy in order to deal with these energy shortages. Uh, so the factors behind the extremely rapid growth of gas demand, it varies throughout the region. Uh, depending on the country's industrialization uh, policies, its, its resource endowments, uh, and the degree that it can rapidly modify its energy and economic policies uh, will vary from country to country. But there are some commonalities that can be discerned uh, between, uh, between the entire region. Uh, we can say that for these reasons here, uh, the rapid economic growth that occurred from about 2001 to 2008, it was about 7% uh, per annum uh, regionally. Uh, because of the demographic boom as well, uh, the economic strategies which encouraged uh, the construction and uh, the implementation of uh, energy intensive uh, policies and industries, uh, there was also uh, increased uh, gas that was used for enhanced oil recovery. And enhanced oil recovery, I'm certain most of you are aware of, but that's when you have uh, a mature oil field or an aging oil field, and then you will basically pump natural gas into that oil field in order to increase its, uh, its pressure, field pressure, so you can continue to have uh, uh, you can continue to have oil production at a rate which you want when the rate has been declining previously due to the aging field. Uh, so a lot of gas has been going towards that, uh, and in the UAE it's about 18 uh, billion cubic significant uh, number. And also the extremely low natural gas prices regionally. Uh, regionally it averages about $1.50. There have been some incremental movements uh, to change this, but so far it really hasn't been uh, that comprehensive or uh, effective. Now this, the extremely low natural gas prices have the, the impact or have the result of, of sparking uh, overconsumption. And, and, and it basically we call this overconsumption artificial. Uh, artificial demand. Uh, why is this artificial demand? That means that uh, these rates would not be present if not for the, uh, some of these more extreme rates would not be present if not for the extremely low natural gas price. Uh, 
Uh, so the extremely low natural gas price is also aligned with the low price of uh, you know of electricity, the electricity tariffs. And then what does this mean? This means that if you don't pay for electricity, it's very simple. It's like don't pay for it, or, or, or if you pay an extremely low rate, then you're much more likely to uh, not be served and to really not, not monitor your use of it. So, so, uh, so uh, this also has an impact of really sparking uh, the very high demand rates in the region. So given this extreme energy consumption by the rapid industrialization I just outlined, uh, this has also pre precipitated an enormous increase in uh, carbon emissions across the region. Because there's an organic linkage between carbon emissions and um, also your energy intensity. So that's the way actually that I look at, uh, I look at carbon emissions. Carbon emissions should be viewed not necessarily just from the environmental <coughs> aspect, although that may be valid in its own right. But the way I look at it is that uh, carbon intensity is basically equivalent to energy intensity. Okay, there's an organic relationship between both of them. So when you decrease your carbon intensity, you increase your energy efficiency. Okay, and I think that this is quite important. So that's my basic thesis, and that's why I think that it's, it's extremely profitable for the Gulf countries to engage in a, a, a coherent carbon mitigation strategy. And given the steady rise in uh, carbon emissions uh, regionally as well, and also the rise in natural gas uh, demand, uh, I think that uh, having a coherent carbon mitigation strategy would be in the best interest of the GCC nations uh, to be able to combat this in a very effective uh, manner. So uh, in a model that I have uh, created more or less, and it's in uh, the handouts, and I, I base this more or less on European experience and also on the Chinese uh, experience of, of attempting to develop a workable model to combat uh, carbon, uh, carbon emissions. And um, the optimal way to lower your energy demand is to tackle it as one of the primary, uh, let's say, uh, one of, uh, tackle it as a parcel of decarbonization of the economy. So in other words, the institution of carbon trading, which I think we will be able to uh, tackle this very effectively. And uh, by incorporation of uh, closely available technology, uh, inexpensive energy gains are possible, uh, perhaps around um, uh, around the level of about 10 to 20 percent, and, and this is across various sectors. Uh, so, steel, aluminum smelting, hydrochemicals, and cement. Okay, and uh, you can have fairly significant energy gains with just commercially available technology. The technology now that you can buy more or less off the shelf, and uh, this is quite significant for a region that has uh, had uh, basically runaway natural gas demand growth of about 7 percent per annum. So, I mean. Just look at it from that off-the-shelf technology. Right now, you can have extreme energy efficiency gains, and then you can imagine what happened when many of the companies actually start getting serious about it, and there's technology transfer, and they start perhaps creating their own technology and what have you, and you can start to have some enormous gains. Now, I'd like to uh, say a word about the region's carbon uh, footprint. Um, the UAE, as we perhaps already know, has the world's largest per capita carbon footprint, while the other Gulf countries are not that far behind. Now, the Gulf countries excluding Yemen committed as a whole about 738 million tons of CO2 in 2008. So this basically equals to about uh, 26, uh, 26 million tons uh, per capita uh, per head, basically. Uh, I'm sorry, not million tons, excuse me, 26 tons, pardon me. <laughs> pardon me. Uh, and some of the Gulf countries, they dealt with this pressure by announcing the establishment of uh, some environmental initiatives in order to Encourage the populace to act in a very environmentally uh, a conscious manner. Uh, and in line with this, uh, both in Dubai and uh, Qatar uh, announced in 2007 that they would implement a carbon trading uh, program uh, in their respective uh, countries. So Qatar and the UAE, they have both taken, uh, at this time before the global financial crisis, relatively substantive uh, steps to combat their carbon emissions as well as their energy uh, intensity in their strategic uh, sectors. Uh, Qatar uh, became the first uh, GCC member to join the World Bank's anti-flaring initiative. And as you know, gas flaring is a major uh, contributor to the region's high emissions. So if you take a satellite uh, photo, or if you look at satellite imagery from the region, you see just enormous uh, gas flaring that is still continuing, even though there's a need for natural gas. Now, they've taken steps to, uh, to, to uh, combat this and to lower it, but it's actually still quite an issue. And you can see it's from, from Space. Now, uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, in line with uh, their new environmentally uh, uh, conscious uh, goals, 
uh, launched a Mustard Mustard Initiative, which we are which we all know of uh, in Energy City, and it's supposed to be obviously the first city that is uh, zero carbon and zero waste. And the country or the, the company that was chosen to implement uh, this uh, vision was the uh, Upper Gobi uh, Future Energy Company, which is also known as uh, Mustard, and it has also invested in a broad array, broad spectrum of clean energy. Uh, technology investments uh, all across the, the MENA region, the Middle East, North Africa region. Uh, before the financial crisis, so uh, Qatar and the UAE, uh, they both announced relatively competitive uh, emissions trading plans because they were in a bit of competition as to which country would, uh, or, or which, uh, you know, in today's case, in, in which Emirates you want to be the hub of carbon trading, but in Qatar's, uh, in Qatar's eyes, they want Doha to be uh, the regional hub. So they're competing to see who would take the mantle of being uh, uh, who would initiate a regional carbon trade or whatnot. And uh, the project in Dubai uh, was supposed to be built around um, or built by the state-run Dubai uh, multi quality Center, the DMCC, and also the then London listed uh, carbon credit uh, EU Securities Company. Before JP Morgan obviously saw to saw to acquire it, and uh, this all these plans are supposed to be constructed no later than 2009. And uh, the proposal in uh, Doha uh, it was supposed to be built by the Doha Bank in 2009. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, each of these projects was really supposed to make uh, uh, its respective country a very dynamic place in order to engage in carbon trading and, and what have you. And also to take advantage of the burgeoning uh, carbon capture projects uh, that could potentially own uh, carbon emission reduction certifications uh, under the UN Protocol uh, mechanism. But when the global financial crisis peaked in 2008, most of these plans were scrapped as the Gulf countries attempted to uh, find a way out of this uh, crisis. And there was obviously a lot of panic at that time, and carbon trading was the last thing uh, on their minds. So obviously, we all remember that. Uh, so I'd like to uh, give a brief overview of uh, how China is looking at, uh, at its carbon emissions issue. Uh, now, an illustration of organic link uh, between energy consumption and carbon emissions uh, nearly simultaneously, China became number one in both of these. Okay, it became number one in terms of the world's uh, absolute uh, carbon emissions, and also became the world's number one energy consumer. Okay, so obviously there's a there's an organic link between both both of them. And then also we know quite recently China became the world's uh, a few weeks ago we became the world's number two economy. So uh, you can look at energy usage in a country, you can look at carbon emissions, and then you can look at that as being an impetus as well for economic development. So this is very important. So uh, if you look at the Industrial Revolution in the West, obviously that was a time of great revolution, but at the same time, that was also a period of extreme economic growth. Uh, so the way to deal with this, uh, at least in the Chinese view, while it has consistently rejected any type of joining, any type of global uh, climate accord, such as Copenhagen and whatnot, uh, in July uh, this, uh, this year, the Chinese National Development Reform Commission uh, reached a consensus to be uh, it reached a consensus that the only way for China to meet this 2020 energy intensity goal uh, was to implement uh, carbon trading. And uh, at the moment, they haven't uh, figured out uh, which particular method they should use, uh, but they have reached consensus. The Chinese leadership is behind it that uh, some type of carbon mitigation framework is necessary in order to increase uh, energy efficiency and to reach its goal by 2020. And this carbon trading is uh, supposed to start within the 12th, 5th year plan period, which is from 2011 uh, until about uh, 2015-16. Uh, but you have to remember that while China is creating what are called the carbon emissions credits, in actuality, this is not based on a per, per unit of carbon emissions, such as a metric ton of carbon. It actually goes back to an energy intensity target. Okay, I think that this is very important. So it's an energy intensity target these carbon emissions uh, credits are going to be based on this energy intensity target. And uh, the participating uh, entities or companies that are able to outperform their energy intensity cap, uh, this would be labeled as an energy savings. And uh, this can be converted to a carbon reduction uh, by applying a factor which would be equivalent uh, to the carbon intensity of the energy source, if that's clear. Uh, so the city of uh, Tianjin, uh, set up um, the Tianjin Carbon Exchange actually to uh, this year to implement carbon trading as part of its overall energy intensity goal by the municipal government. So China's already taken substantive 
or at least preliminary steps, and they agreed in principle to institute this. So, so China is pretty much leadership is unified behind it as well. Um, some Western countries are still lagging behind it. This is interesting because uh, for those who have serious questions about whether you can maintain a very rapid rate of industrialization but at the same time instituting carbon emission reductions, I think China is able to be a primary exemplar in that regard. So it doesn't necessarily have to be, uh, uh, let's say, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to negatively impact your carbon or your economic growth. Uh, and we all know that the, the Chinese leadership would not be what you consider to be green in any way, shape, or form. But they recognize, recognize the economic benefits through bringing down the energy intensity. And environmental benefits are of secondary concern to the Chinese uh, leadership. Uh, recently, they have been showing a bit more concern with the environmental issues. And we know that they're making a few, um, some people say, half-hearted steps to clean up water and to eliminate uh, pollution uh, dumping, open pollution dumping in the rivers, um, at least if it's not secret to us, I suppose. But, um, Still, their primary concern is the economy and that nothing can jeopardize economic growth for them. So this is one of the reasons that they want to implement this uh, carbon exchange in order to facilitate uh, uh, a lessening of their uh, carbon emissions. But uh, at the same time that they're doing this, they're not doing this, their, their general position on joining uh, any type of global climate accord has not changed. Uh, they still strikingly protect it, and they don't want to be held to any legally binding uh, climate targets. Don't want this at all. So this is something that I think we should also consider when we look at the, the Gulf. So I think in this way, uh, China can serve as a model uh, for the Gulf countries uh, as they tackle their energy shortages. And I also want to show you this is the result of uh, the energy shortages uh, in the Gulf. Unfortunately, I mean, I mean, I'm not certain. If, uh, I, I'm certain that here today we must have not seen this, but in Kuwait and in many other areas, uh, it uh, unfortunately during the summer months it. Uh, Dark outside. Uh, now, in terms of um, my proposed metrics for a golf, uh, for a golf uh, carbon trading platform, uh, I nearly all carbon emissions mitigation frameworks uh, can be classified into three overarching uh, concepts. You can either have a cap and trade system, you can have a hybrid system, you can have a carbon tax scheme. Now, I mean, you can uh, you can uh, reconfigure these in other models. But I mean, these are the three overarching concepts. Now, in the interest of time, and uh, I don't want to unnecessarily confuse because the hybrid model is not as popular, so I'm not going to go over that, but it's in my, uh, my publication. But I'll just discuss uh, briefly the overall pros and cons of, um, of the cap and trade system and of the carbon tax scheme, which, which are some of the most popular whenever you hear about um, any type of carbon mitigation uh, framework. So while the mechanics differ for each system, the foundation of each is that it uh, seeks to make a commodity of carbon, okay, that's the main issue. So previously, worthless, uh, 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 how can I say, not item, but a previously worthless thing is thereby made into uh, a potentially viable commodity. Okay, so this is a, a very important concept behind any type of uh, carbon mitigation framework. Uh, so as most of us know, a cap and trade system is primarily an administrative approach to mitigating carbon emissions. And what it would do is provide economic incentives for achieving quantifiable reductions uh, in uh, pollution emission. And it also will place caps on a number of emission sources. So these emission sources could be uh, something as small as a car, or it could be as large as an entire factory complex. So it doesn't really matter. You can scale it up quite, uh, quite easily. But just it has to have within it a type of emissions, a point emission source. Okay? And then with that, you put a cap on it, thereby limiting how much carbon that particular source can. So in order to um, to evade paying the carbon price, and this would be uh, basically the equivalent to, um, well, okay, each particular source would receive a set number of permits, okay, or, or an allocation in order to, uh, uh, to be able to emit. And it, it, each permit or allowance would be equal generally to about one metric ton of, of carbon. So in order to avoid paying the price, uh, what a carbon intensive uh, uh, company or, or industry would do is attempt to either become much more efficient, uh, or it would invest in renewable energy technology, or it would transition to less carbon intensive fuels. So basically, a cap and trade uh, would allow uh, the participants to determine the most cost effective approach in order to, uh, to decrease its emissions. Uh, or in its absence, if it's not able to do that in a very effective way, it would basically purchase the permits from emitters who are successfully able to reduce their emissions through buying their 
So in theory, it allows those who can reduce emissions to be able to do it at the lowest cost uh, available, and it would thereby reduce pollution at the lowest cost uh, to society. Now, the cap and trade system uh, has been a lot of criticism uh, throughout the years. Uh, some skeptics that basically say that the cap and trade system allows the individual emitters to evade responsibility. Uh, others say that it could unleash economic havoc uh, by, uh, uh, by basically increasing inflationary pressures, and this is one of the major arguments you hear uh, whenever a country doesn't want to, uh, want to uh, implement it. And uh, each criticism assumes, though, that the cap and trade system would pass on additional costs to consumers and, and have a, basically spark a rapid increase and um, increase the prices of, of manufactured products. So this isn't necessarily the case. I mean, there, obviously, there could be some type of price increase, but it could happen at a very uh, rational, graduated uh, level. It depends on the type of uh, system that is instituted. It doesn't necessarily have to uh, cause that kind of chaos immediately when the system is announced. So, I mean, it's not necessarily a chicken little bit. Uh, now, uh, in terms of uh, carbon tax, uh, uh, this would be especially uh, difficult to get it off. Uh, I think actually it would not work. Uh, why? Because most of the GCC members obviously have a policy of minimal taxation. I think that's why most of us are probably here. Uh, they also have a free economic zones as well. And uh, so therefore, any strategy to implement a type of uh, environmental tax or carbon tax uh, would uh, generally be incompatible with the overall Gulf strategy of initiating industrialization by attracting FDI. Right, so the Gulf countries, much like any country, is not going to directly attack their very reason for industrialization. So just like China is extremely jealous of its, um, it's being the number one source for low cost, or the number one provider of low cost labor for manufacturing for, for simple manufactured goods. Okay, China is not going to implement any policy at the moment that would directly attack that because that is reason. Success and it's saying that the Gulf Office is not going to implement any policy that would directly contradict the reason for its very economic growth. Uh, so one of, but but the cap and trade or the, the the tax system, the carbon tax, actually it does have some benefits. Uh, one benefit that is in contrast to some of the other systems, it is relatively straightforward. And businesses love predictability, as we know. So if you have a well-crafted system, it would remove the uncertainty and price fluctuation that the business sector abhors. And uh, furthermore, if you have uh, an even or, or rational tax that's implemented fairly, uh, the government would not be able to pick industrial winners or losers or industrial champions, okay, if you have a, a fair taxation, uh, carbon taxation scheme in place. So those are some of the positive uh, aspects of it. But um, one of the most negative aspects, though, obviously, in addition to the minimal taxation policies of the Gulf, is that uh, many of the GCC states are Monte Off states, obviously, and they derive a significant portion of their uh, national revenue uh, for the sale of, of uh, natural resources. So uh, if the GCC states did attempt to impose a uh, carbon taxation uh, scheme, there would be very high political and economic costs. Uh, the energy intensive industries as well are a very powerful and influential lobby in the Gulf, and um, they form an essential part of their national strategies uh, to basically institute economic uh, diversification away from just exporting unrefined oil or Process natural gas because for many decades uh, the Gulf, uh, when it wasn't industrialized, it just exported oil and then the industrialized countries would, uh, would uh, create or, or would use that in order to produce uh, manufactured goods and then it would export these goods to the Gulf. So the Gulf is trying to change, the Gulf countries are trying to change this entire dynamic. They want to be the center of production of value added goods, um, uh, manufactured products, and ship these to the West. So I want to change this entire uh, uh, paradigm, uh, which is uh, very interesting. And uh, so in this particular political and economic environment, uh, a carbon tax would be perhaps the least effective carbon mitigation tool. Of the so I mean, in short, uh, a cap and trade system, in my view, would actually be the most optimal model uh, for carbon mitigation in the Gulf. And the Gulf businesses, they generally support this uh, method as well. Uh, they support a permit-based trading model and also having initial disbursements of uh, free allowances, voluntary, uh, a voluntary system at first phase one with free allowances. They think that this would be the most viable method if carbon uh, mitigation uh, regime were, were introduced. And also a 2007 uh, poll of the Gulf businesses uh, by the Middle East Economic Digest found that 88% uh, of those polled 
uh, supported the introduction uh, of those quote amongst Middle Eastern businesses, uh, supported the introduction of a uh, cap and trade model. Uh, so I think that it indicates that there has been some type of acceptance of this uh, model. And um, the reason that Gulf based businesses and industrial groups tend to support this is uh, because it could offer significant opportunities for emissions uh, reductions in a multitude of carbon intensive uh, sectors and also encourages technological innovations as well in the sectors which are not regulated and what we call the uncapped sectors because there'd be a general uh, percolating, I guess, or a general spread of technology best practices throughout the entire economy. Okay, so uh, basically all sectors of the economy could benefit potentially uh, from having a cap and trade. Now in terms of the construction of the optimal golf system, uh, the GCC does not have to be the wheel. Okay, so uh, carbon trading has already been done. Uh, more or less successfully, uh, if you can say, at least in the European context, there have been several notable problems with, obviously, uh, the European experiment. But overall, it showed that uh, a relatively advanced region can institute carbon trading, and it hasn't brought uh, economic chaos. I mean, there is economic chaos, obviously, in Europe at this time, but it's not related to, to climate, uh, climate trading, so, or to carbon trading. And uh, one of the most important lessons, though, that uh, can be gleaned from the uh, 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 ETS, Emissions Trading Scheme, uh, is that uh, there needs to be uh, verified and uh, accurate emissions data. This is absolutely essential because uh, you would base your base carbon caps on this on this data that you have. So if your data is incorrect, uh, then you wouldn't be able to adequately uh, construct a, a system of caps. I mean, so uh, you couldn't uh, over allocate, which is one of the reasons why the European Union uh, had significant problems with and that was a, a very, very big problem. Uh, and uh, this caused the, the carbon price to fall to actually near zero in the EU ETS. Uh, so uh, in order to make certain that you have uh, data, it cannot be stressed enough. If you want to have adequate data, you have to benchmark, benchmark, benchmark. Uh, that's extremely important because only if you have a credible baseline uh, would our hypothetical golf regulator uh, be able to set a workable uh, emissions target. And uh, the overall goal of any type of uh, golf regulator would be to create a type of uh, Darwinistic environment. I think this is very important because this would encourage technological innovation. Uh, so scarcity, scarcity of the, the, the carbon emissions allowances or credits is absolutely essential uh, to, to, to encourage the influence, uh, to even force companies to adapt uh, the best available technology to lower uh, carbon emissions. And this is the operative concept that would drive any workable carbon emissions trading platform. And um, ideally, uh, a golf trading platform should be created in three phases. Uh, you should have a phase introduction of a carbon cap and, um, and with the um, subsequent market as well that would allow adequate time for the various industrial sectors to, to acclimate uh, their human and technological resources uh, to the new carbon constraint reality. Uh, and uh, phase one should also be a voluntary cap. I don't think it should be really defined in uh, so this should be a more learning by doing period uh, where companies and organizations are really getting themselves up to speed. And also the bureaucracy or the governments as well, the regulators, they would also learn how to adequately determine the benchmarks and, and, to, uh, and to deal with this new uh, sector that they're, that they're regulating. And uh, in contrast, uh, the reason why they, one of the reasons why the EU ETS bill was because it failed to allow the industrial sector enough time uh, to institute uh, substantive uh, technological changes. I think phase two as well should be mandated to last for a period of about five to seven years. And uh, this would enable a gradual uh, tightening of the annual cap and encourage technological adaptation. Uh, and when phase three is there after launch, the, the golf regulators would be relatively sophisticated and able to set more ambitious targets. And uh, since the economic and industrial sectors would be already, they would already understand and be well versed in, in this new uh, jargon, this new language. Uh, and understand how the trading system works, uh, they would have already have invested significantly in carbon mitigation technology. And uh, I'll just like to give one quick word about the threat of carbon leakage. So uh, in addition to inflation I mentioned earlier, which is one of the arguments against carbon trading, one of the reasons why a country would not want to uh, implement that, is uh, another reason is carbon leakage, the threat of carbon leakage. And carbon leakage is, is basically uh, the theory uh, that when one country implements extremely stringent carbon reduction 
targets that uh, energy intensive industries from that particular country would flee to another country that has a bit uh, less stringent or no carbon emissions um, uh, regulations whatsoever. So basically, uh, the argument is that uh, all that economic, uh, basically economic growth would be stunted uh, if there were any type of implementation of, of, uh, of a carbon mitigation framework. Uh, so how would a Gulf country deal with this? Uh, one of the ways that a Gulf country deal with this is to implement a uh, type of carbon trading platform collectively across the region. So that way, uh, energy intensive industry in, in the UAE, for instance, that is, uh, enjoys its low labor costs, enjoys a uh, relatively flexible regulatory uh, scene, and, and low uh, natural gas uh, prices, and they won't just flee to Saudi Arabia, okay, or flee to uh, flee to Oman, or what have you. So if it's uh, implemented collectively by all the Gulf countries, then one country, one country's loss would not be another country's gain. And, and that is also one of the reasons why the Gulf countries would not want to unilaterally implement any type of carbon mitigation framework because, because of this fear. But I think that there would be little fear if the GCC collectively implemented that type of uh, carbon trading uh, uh, system. Uh, uh, because uh, even with a carbon scheme in the Gulf, uh, the GCC is extremely attractive for foreign investors uh, because the region has enormous energy reserves, uh, nearly a quarter of the world's uh, natural gas reserves. Extremely low labor costs, uh, minimal taxation rate, central location. As we all know, uh, as you say, the bridge between uh, the crossroads between Europe, Africa, and Asia. And these competitive advantages uh, will continue to attract FDI and encourage countries to continue onward with the modernization programs. And uh, lastly, uh, with uh, some of the research that I undertook uh, with the Oxford Institute of Energy Studies, uh, we drew up uh, many forecasts as to what uh, the, the Gulf would look like in terms of energy shortage next decade, and um, the forecasts that, uh, that we developed were actually quite daunting, uh, they even surprised me to a certain extent, because we saw that uh, the energy crisis was actually widened, uh, regardless of the economic scenario. So let's say we take scenario one, okay, where uh, the, the, the global recession actually uh, 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 remains, okay, and then the, the global economic recession remains, and uh, there isn't a big for the next, at least until 2015, there's still going to be extreme uh, energy uh, natural gas shortages. Uh, and the gas shortages will reach from about uh, 19 billion cubic meters in 2009 to about 31 billion cubic meters in 2015. Now, if scenario two is relaxed, uh, then in global growth does pick up within the next year or two, and in shortage will expand to about, uh, with our forecast, which have this as has its own assumptions and whatnot, but uh, we, we forecast that it would increase about 50, 50 million cubic meters, uh, which is quite significant. So many of the countries in the region would uh, thereby become major energy importers, uh, much as uh, Kuwait did in 2000, or came in 2009 when it uh, imported LNG. And Kuwait's LNG, coincidentally, is coming from as far away as Sakhalin Ireland from Russia, uh, which, which does not make a whole lot of sense. And, it's, you know, it's, and some of it comes from Australia as well. And uh, Dubai, also this year, is becoming an uh, LNG importer. Uh, so uh, this, many of the countries look at this as only a short-term response, uh, but actually this is not. This is actually uh, the way of the future, the way that I see if there's not some type of radical intervention. And uh, one of the ways to at least attempt to forestall this is by uh, influencing the energy-intensive companies to invest in carbon mitigation technology. So uh, a golf cap and trade system, I think, would not only assist the golf uh, in its new perspective of, being inter of its international engagement uh, in the fight against global warming, so thereby there's a bit of prestige associated with that, but it would also preserve its natural resources for future generations uh, while bringing in additional uh, revenue streams. So uh, in short, uh, the golf should look at carbon trading as uh, being able to lower the impact <coughs> And uh, it should strive to increase its energy efficiency per unit of GDP uh, based on the Chinese model. And then it should also implement the regulatory structure of cap and trade on the European model. So I also uh, caution, uh, while this would be implemented voluntarily, I, I don't think uh, for the best interests of the Gulf countries that they should join, at least in the near term to mid term, uh, any type of legally binding global uh, climate policy. So I, I actually don't think this would be beneficial. So I think that they should move ahead with instituting a regional process, but they shouldn't have any globally, globally legally binding uh, targets because I think that it could uh, impact uh, 
their economic growth. And I think that they should join any type of global uh, economic, um, uh, any type of global uh, climate accord on its own schedule when it's ready. And uh, that's all I have to say. So I, I open up the floor for any questions uh, that you have. Thank you.
just, just following up on, on, on the, uh, the price issue, I mean, it's, it's, studies have come out actually saying that they will not increase the uh, electricity prices for at least for the, the consumer sector because it's politically uh, unfeasible. And it's, it's, uh, although I have seen some talk about some regional coordination about some price uh, of, of uh, and prices for uh, fuel products, um, but I think you're not going to see electricity uh, tariffs uh, being being at market price anytime soon. Um, so. I, 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 I think though the gas price increase is coming. I think it's coming because there are too many internal external forces that are operating. I mean, I mean in terms of the, the internal forces, I mean there are just energy shortages across the region. I mean, I mean, and any time a gas project is going to come online, even if you even if you start today, you have a timeline of about five years, and that's if everything goes goes great. I mean, if, if the stars are aligned. And, uh, so, because of that, uh, the countries, I mean, the GCC countries, they have to overcome their natural resistance uh, to higher gas prices because otherwise you have to buy from Qatar or about five or six dollars per MBT or buy from someone, perhaps Shell or whatnot, or they will produce it themselves. And then when they start to do that, then that um, the domestic gas price would thereby operate as a subsidy, it would be a straight subsidy, and then you would start to have revenue losses and, and, and what have you, budgetary drains. It's one thing you'd have potential WTO issues uh, because these are going to key manufacturing uh, sectors and, and, and so on. So, I mean, I mean there are just too many forces operating. And we've already seen incremental increases in the gas prices being paid as well, and also incremental rises domestically. Although this is not really followed under prices that countries have paid, but as soon as they have to start paying uh, more or less market based rates for LNG, uh, then you're, you're going to start to see not that long of a timeline or a time lag before they start increasing at least on increments. Their, uh, their domestic uh, gas prices. Yeah, well, the sad is already made noises that they might allow some high cost of gas to be sold directly to consumers, well, like big industrial Yes, yes, exactly. At, at a price that actually does cover the cost of production. Yeah, exactly. And that's a bypass the whole subsidy. So, right, exactly. And there would also be the question as to whether the petrochemical industry is actually uh, that competitive. Okay, I mean, I mean they've been uh, quite concerned about gaining market share okay, within the coming years. But the issue is, okay, if that's based on a low cost, and a low, a low price uh, gas strategy, is that really a sustainable policy? I mean, are you simply just subsidizing consumption in, in, in industrialized countries in the European Union or what, what have you, or in Asia? Uh, so I think that policy should be called into question as well uh, when this higher price natural gas starts to come on the scene. I mean, so I think then there could be a, a wake-up call more or less as to much of the leadership as to whether this is sustainable or not. I mean, starts turning to a direct subsidy to these sectors. You know, Dolphin, I heard, um, I mean, there, there's still about you know, some, a million uh, BCF capacity on, on the pipelines not utilized, but the Qataris don't want to sell it at the same, at the same price. Correct. So there, there has already been some talk of a price retalk, not just for that additional BCF, but for the entire uh, contract. But that's still... Yeah, of course, I don't know if to Japan and Korea and the Chinese and they're willing to pay. Yeah, the opportunity cost is... is, is, is is right. significantly it's, higher, it's, so it's we're all brothers and everything, but it's, uh, they don't really Brothers must be too. You know, I, 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 I tend to agree with Robin that, that simplest measures, okay, so the price increase is maybe not the only one, but simple measures like that is actually perhaps something you should tackle first. I mean, I know in Kuwait that they show on television in the summer is this is, 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 uh, indicator and, and indicator that to the red, you really have to switch off your, you know, your air conditioning because then you're really close to a blackout. And actually, when they do that, People do that. Yes, yes. A lot of people leave Kuwait in the summer and they leave the air on because they don't mind. Because you know, I'm just talking about general public. Yes. Because they don't have to, you know, they don't feel it in, in, in their in their own world. And they don't feel it as a there's not any matter too much. They say, and, and even the buildings are not really built that energy efficient. But I think if you if you start with a system that encourages you know, energy efficiency, yes. value of energy, but even water, water of course. But in, in, in one of the reasons why Kuwait and, and, and perhaps also Saudi is actually so high in their CO2 emissions is because of the uh, burning of crude oil. Why do they burn crude oil? Because in Kuwait they can afford it. It's still relatively cheap. But if they have a real market price for these products, I think you would see from the consumer point of view, the most informed people, you would see a real, real strong, uh, affordable change. And I think that is perhaps as Interesting to debate is that perhaps maybe the quicker solution than starting a carbon capture system. 
Yes. 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 I absolutely understand. Just increase the price, basically, to look at our efficient demand. Okay. Basically, that is a much more Yes. Well, well, I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm a huge advocate of that, actually. I, 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 I subscribe to that. I think that, I mean, first and foremost, you need to increase gas prices. Okay, and that's coming. Okay, first and foremost. Okay, but you did discuss about energy efficiency. Okay, from the consumer side, how would you do that? Would that be a regulatory method, or would that be voluntary? And if you're already doing that, then basically what you can do is you just develop a more comprehensive system for it. And that's the only thing that I'm saying is because if you look at most hotels now. In most newer ones, you have to put your card in when you get, in, when you get into the room and you have to take it out when you leave. Okay, that's just one simple method of lowering your, your energy demand or lowering your power demand. Okay? But the only thing that would be is just simply controlling uh, a, a, a method like that and responding to uh, putting it under some type of a carbon uh, emission framework. That's it. Because there are already steps that the government's are taking. Okay, but it's just something disjointed. Okay, and it has a one stop tag. That's the only thing. So it has to be a multi-tier strategy. One, you increase your gas prices. I'm a huge proponent of that. And that has to be done. And the countries are going to start doing that. And still, and they want to start doing that. Okay. But then another method as well is it's also the carbon uh, emissions uh, mitigation framework. That's a big deal. It's only it's only not only gas prices, it's all petrol prices. Yeah. You see the yeah. most amount of it. Largest uh, gas consuming cars probably here in the States. Yes. Why? Because in the States and here, uh, the fuel prices are ridiculous. So yes. extraordinary low. Yes. So there's no benefit for me to buy a, a car which is extremely energy efficient, which all people do in Europe. Mm -hmm. Because you know, it, it, it makes sense. It, it, you feel it after two, two years, it, it pay off. This, yes. this, 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 this cheap car. Uh, and, and here, it's just, just not an incentive. And, and I think. Gradually, you get, and it takes time, but gradually you, you get to uh, see the benefits. And, and I think it's a very strong magnet that yeah. money, you know, uh, where the money flows is, is where consumers uh, take some of the decisions. And here, frankly, I think, was, uh, I think uh, petrol price really is not the deciding factor whether they choose car A or car B yes. in terms of uh, fuel efficiency. Yes, yes, yes. I absolutely agree with that. But, but I think that. That's a bit long time year to, to, to get to that. Yes, right? yes. Not a, not a, not a yes, yes, yes. I, but but in, in Europe, you also have energy security issues, energy dependence issues, and what have you. Uh, uh, but in the Gulf, the main way that we can separate natural gas from petrol is that uh, with petrol, there are no supply constraints with petrol. Okay? Or with natural gas, there are supply constraints. Okay? Um, I, well, I'm not aware of any country which has significant supply constraints in terms of uh, gasoline. Well, in terms of oil production, gasoline, refined gasoline, yes, excuse me, refined gasoline, yes. But in terms of oil production, uh, no. But in terms of natural gas production, there are. So my argument for a carbon emission production scheme would actually be to tackle this energy shortage, more or less. Okay, that, that's the main reason for my argument, the main thesis in my argument. And then petrol, perhaps the transportation sector could come at some later point, of, point, of point in time. But essentially, this energy shortage needs to be combated. Basically, you just bring all these various initiatives that some companies are, are undertaking on their own, some municipal or Emirati governments are taking on their own, which are Emirati, just basically draw it under one umbrella. Okay. No, okay. Yes. If, you, if you increase prices, I mean, some gas fields, you just can't develop for 75 cents. Yes, yes. Well, this, the gas prices are like very 75 cents. Okay. I think it's very difficult to find the gas field that you can just develop. The, the, the cost, there, there, there is no, costs are there, so much right. higher. There is a lot associated. So there's a lot of incentive to, yes. if the gas price was four or five dollars, mm -hmm. you at least would be able to open up some fields and send it. Or how do we in GCC countries where, you know, where just at the moment it's just for uh, international companies or even national companies, it's not attractive to, to develop these fields. So it has some benefits too that if the prices are high, you can, you, can, you can actually see a bit more development of yes. some of those, uh, those fields. Yeah. It's not a scarcity problem, man. On the fuels on the oil side, but it's, it's an opportunity cost problem. Yes, That's yes. why in Saudi, you see the Americans of the world mm -hmm. actually the ones leading the charge for Saudi to develop nuclear or renewables power because they'd rather take that oil that they're selling to the power plants yes, and, and sell it yes. for yes. Yes. five yes. bucks as opposed to Absolutely. five or ten Absolutely. bucks that they're selling. Absolutely. 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 I mean, I, I, mean, I, 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 I think I'm thinking of the gas charges, right? When we see what happened in the US, you know, gas prices, natural gas prices went very high, but suddenly we find Show, yes. sure. that is no shortage. And I think if you have gas prices in the Gulf, like four or five dollars, you see exactly the same. No end of 
the more difficult gas in this market. Well, uh, but, but I'm not saying that I don't think there's a good solution to the energy prices. Yes. There are three reasons and carbon's one. Yes. But you know, it's, it might be a tentative solution for some levels. Well, actually, I mean, I mean I've, I've spoken before actually about the, the gas issue specifically. And, 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 um, and, and I can tell you that uh, this current period of the glut in terms of uh, the, the gas glut in the world, okay, uh, the, the Gulf is in a very interesting position. Okay, in the sense that it is has a very constrained natural gas sector, it's experiencing a shortage, uh, whereby the rest of the world has a pumped. Okay, and that, that's a very odd situation. I mean, the region has nearly a quarter of the natural gas uh, global reserves. Uh, so, at this point in time, actually, many of the countries can actually start the beginning steps to come to some type of um, agreement for either gas export or what have you. And we see this with Qatar. Because Qatar is not able, Qatar wants to penetrate the U.S. market, for instance, with the shale gas has really destroyed that notion. And also, it sails to Europe as well. Europe is not taking as many uh, LNG cargoes. Uh, so, there's a lot of access supply. And then, uh, Qatar dramatically up its LNG production to about 77 and a times uh, per year, actually, this year. Uh, so, Qatar has a lot of excess gas. Uh, so, this has actually pushed the countries to come to some type of uh, uh, agreement uh, with, uh, with the other uh, Gulf nations, the consuming Gulf nations. And also, uh, what could be done is that Qatar could uh, renegotiate uh, some of these contracts because the countries now will be willing to accept a lower price, their LNG. And at this time, at this point in time where the consuming Gulf countries have extreme energy shortages, they're willing to pay a bit more, okay, much above the dollar fifty cents. So, this is going to be the reality that's going to cause a change in their uh, perspective. Because as you said, it costs nearly four or five hours to produce these new unconventional fields, these unassociated uh, unconventional gas fields. Okay? Now this price was logical, the 75 cents was logical when you were producing oil, okay, then the gas was associated with a byproduct. Okay? So once you had the capital infrastructure in place, then uh, each additional unit of gas produced was basically a cost of nothing. The cost was probably zero. Okay? But when you have to produce a new unassociated Unconventional gas field that's extremely sour, uh, it has a lot of sulfur in it, uh, perhaps it's its tightest hundred D. Okay, this is going to cost a lot more money. Okay, and then when this starts to happen, okay, kind of a Phillips put on the shop gas field, okay, simply because they realized economics. So after the party was over, when they signed, you know, after their bid was accepted, they signed a contract, then they sat down and started to do the economics and looked at it, then they saw that all the gas is going to be directed towards the domestic market and the price is what about a dollar per the BTU, and that's not attractive what starts, so they put out. Okay, so they're getting very strong signals from the market that the countries are not going to sell to them anymore. They're going to give them a brotherly political price. Okay, and that now to, to even get any type of international participation to produce these fields, you're going to have to increase the prices for domestic sales. Okay, so I mean everything is moving in this direction. They're getting extremely strong signals from the outside and from the inside that this policy cannot be continued. Okay, I mean so for me that, that's a major aspect of, of, of my model. Okay, I mean, so the increase in gas prices is just one method, uh, okay. one, one tool to do that. But I mean, I, I, I've studied this issue in depth, and, and I, I absolutely agree with you. It's essential, but it's just one, a major part, but it's, it's, it's only one part of this market. I just wanted to uh, get your view on the real likelihood of any form of carbon trading platform uh, being set up in this region. Because I look at like, CDM projects, for yes. example. That really, for this region, to my mind, is like a carrot in the sense that people should want to be implementing energy efficiency projects or renewable projects or uh, implement uh, gas, gas flaring prevention measures. But CDM projects throughout this region just haven't worked. And this is money from, in effect, yes. Europe yes. giving to yes. GCNC nations to actually help implement these new mechanisms. And when you've actually implemented a carrot mechanism and there's no uptake. Yes. Why would they ever consider a carbon trading platform where, in effect, it's um, a, more like a, a stick method as opposed to um, sort of the carrot method? So, yes. we've so, kind of seen some evidence here that when there are incentives in place, people aren't still interested in implementing any sort of method along these lines. So, do you think it's just quite a fanciful idea that carbon trading will ever work in this region, unless if there's some, you know? Global accord, and you know, there's some legislation put in place, and it has to be done. Okay, so you're forcing me to go from the theoretical to the practical. Okay, 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 but seriously, uh, it's a very good point. But uh, you're right, you're right. There hasn't really been a uh, very significant, uh, there hasn't been significant interest even taking the low hanging fruit of, of these uh, you know, CDM projects, yes. But uh, in, before the global economic crisis, uh, before the peak of it in 2008, there were movements to to the Carter trading platform. Okay, both in Dubai and Lotto. Okay, and then the financial crisis threw everything into disarray. Okay, but there already were substantive movements to, to put this in place. Okay, and then this uh, intervention of the economic crisis caused countries to be a bit confused. It caused the Gulf countries to be a bit confused and had to really find themselves. So as the global economy picks back up, in my view, okay, and as the pressure becomes uh, very uh, significant, at least emanating from the outside, okay, because now the pressure becomes quite great from the outside world, saying that, okay, golf, you cannot continue to to uh, to emit, uh, okay, uh, extremely large amounts of carbon. Okay, this is simply unacceptable. Okay, so as the world really starts to criticize the golf on the scale that it has criticized China, we're going to see a lot of um, uh, we're going to see more of an understanding that, that they would implement uh, carbon trading at least to attempt to mitigate this, uh, this criticism from the outside. And uh, another reason why I think that they would do this is also for the prestige um, uh, factor, uh, because the Gulf countries are becoming much more active in the global economic infrastructure. Okay, so if you look at Saudi Arabia has, um, has become quite active in the G20, for instance, representing the, the Arab nations or the Gulf nations. Okay, so as they're moving from their previously passive position, okay, we're going to adjust them. Um, you know, ledger security needs to be taken care of by others, uh, invest in passive, uh, passive securities or, or TOs or what have you. Now they're starting to take very aggressive uh, acquisitions uh, in many companies, okay? And, and I think all this is related, okay? They're, they're actually taking a much larger uh, profile uh, in the world. And with this larger profile, it's also going to become greater responsibility. So I think that as the global economy picks back up, and I think due to all these reasons I outlined before that, these steps that were taken before the global economic crisis would resume. Okay? And another thing too is that uh, if it's voluntary, they really have nothing to lose. Okay? It's just basically they would see how it goes, and if they think that the method or the model that they've created has actually worked for them, then we could start to see further steps that come back. When you say voluntary, sorry, is yes. it voluntary for the companies joining the system? Yes. But in which case, if you're a huge carbon polluter, why would you join? Okay, uh, simply because most of, okay, most of the large companies in the uh, golf are run by whom? Sorry? Most of the large companies in the golf are run by whom? Well, government. Okay. So then, if it's voluntary, it would be voluntary that you have to do this because this is a direct, this is more or less, you know, a, a suggestion that's coming from the government for entities that are owned by, that are SOBs more or less, state owned enterprises, okay? So it wouldn't necessarily be binding at first, okay? But this would be a suggestion, it would be, it would be basically a, a suggestion on how these companies can, uh, can start to learn the new language of this new current industry reality. Isn't, isn't the issue with, with CDMs as well as that they're mainly, at, at least the way they started, they're meant as carrots for the industrialized countries to be able to make these projects in, in third world countries and benefit from, from, from the, the credit they get there to meet their targets. And part of the problem, as you mentioned, is that with very little emissions data, etc., CDMs didn't really take off here. They're starting to take off in China and elsewhere, where you're starting to get some, some um, measurements and, 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 and exact parameters of, of these certificates that you can take back and trade in Europe. Uh, but we're not there yet. Uh, and, and also there's an R point to CDM is uh, more or less, uh, you, you point this out correctly, more or less when an industrialized country, an Annex 1 country, would invest uh, in a non-Annex 1 country. Okay? Uh, so that would be more along the lines of JI, joint implementation. They have joint implementation, which would thereby two non-Annex countries thereby invest in each other's jurisdiction or to lower uh, carbon emissions. Yes. Right. Okay. Right. So I mean, I mean, within a golf context, we would look at it more from that aspect rather than CDM. Well, CDM is still a factor, but... Golf is all non annex one. Right, they're all non annex one. And I think you should say that way. I mean, so I think that, well, they have... But I think it's all, right? If you've got a country in, I don't know, you know, know like a company in Germany that starts investing in Dubai's kind of CO2. Yes. Yeah. A lot of NGOs in Europe say that's not really the idea of CDM. You're going to be helping, you know, African countries and so on. You're not going to be helping all the rich place like Dubai. No, 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 no. Uh, I'll come sure, my friend. No. I mean, I, mean I, I think that it would actually be for countries such as Dubai that have... Uh, Significant emissions. 
the Jedi because not Jedi because or even CDM because uh, even Africa for I mean Africa for instance doesn't really have that I mean, doesn't really have a heavy industrial base. So right? Maybe, yeah, so sure, it does. I mean the whole point of the Annex One and Annex Two was the Annex Two guys yes. didn't have flying emissions. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and, yes. and the, the oil exports event that made sense in 1990 doesn't make a lot of sense to the oil exporters today not to be not to be grouped with bigger businesses. Yes, 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 that is one of the criticisms. Yes, 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 that's a significant criticism that they against the golf, that they are industrialized. Yeah, that more or less that they're industrialized. Well, I mean, the the highest, we have the GDP in so right. you, you put it in a group that you know, yeah, yeah, Yes, 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 that, that's true. But I mean, I think industrial, mm -hmm. to say industrialized, that implies many things. It implies many things, not just your GDP. I mean, so I mean, I would, uh, I think uh, Borneo, what is it, uh, Borneo, is it, no, not, uh, mm -hmm. Brunei, Brunei. I mean, what is your, I mean, their GDP, I think, is, is quite high, is it not? Like, but I mean, I mean, but still, I mean, would you call them an industrialized country? Okay, so I mean, I think GDP is necessarily the only indicator that that you could use, even though they could be extremely wealthy. I mean, everything you, you have to look at the legal code, you have to look at uh, you know, yeah, you know, policies, capacity, right? Yeah, some capacity, and, capacity and, and so on. Not merely GDP. But no. still, it's not, you know, I think mean, my point is just in the oil exports now. Are, yes. There is something of a special case. Uh, yes, yes. In the same way as all the stuff in the states. Yes. Yeah, right, because they're second world countries, yeah. and uh, they industrialize what they didn't really have a consumer uh, industry or whatnot. So, yeah, absolutely. How do you think of Yes, all of this is predicated on baselining, as you said, that you pointed out that in Europe the whole system got wobbly because it didn't baseline effectively. Mm -hmm. How do you see baselining working in practice here in terms of getting the baseline, auditing the baseline? implementing the baseline from a governmental perspective. How do you see that working in practice? Uh, well, basically, they would just have to build up capacity uh, in order to understand uh, what it uh, requires to, uh, uh, of, of the emissions of each particular industry. Okay, so if you look at uh, the construction industry, if you look at, uh, let's say, the oil and gas industry, okay, what are their emissions, first of all? So they would require going to several different plants, okay, that's in the larger players, look at their emissions over a period of time, Okay, and I would suggest actually you would have uh, more of a, a longer time period, okay, uh, as opposed to a shorter time period. I mean, so the EUTS actually had uh, a shorter time period, a shorter time span, and I think that that's why I think that was a novelist year that they throw off their entire baseline. Okay, so if you look at the global economic uh, crisis, that throw off the baseline, okay, of, of, of much of the, the, the system. Or if you look at the collapse of the Soviet Union, for instance, okay, that throw off baseline. Okay. <laughs> that actually became their baseline. Right, that became their baseline. Then. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, so I, I would say that, that uh, the first phase, that would be the phase where you would start getting your data for the baseline construction. Okay, and it should be a long, long enough period for by some anomalous year or two and not throw off the entire data set. Okay, and then that would be learning by doing, you would build up capacity and so on, and get them into plants, being able to record their carbon emissions, and then you would plug this in. Okay, and then thereby form an average unit your carbon emissions, uh, or your uh, uh, allowances would be based on that. You also had a slide that indicated that there was some initiative to increase petrochemical production in the UAE. Mm -hmm. uh, you've already got shortages. Uh, that petrochemical initiative could affect demand from a number of perspectives, both including gas and including uh, refined uh, petrochemical feedstocks. How do you see that working in practice as managing the shortage that already exists. Okay, so in the sense your question is, how can they continue to increase your petrochemical production when they already have an energy shortage? Yes, in, in, because in, yes, you're yes. balancing energy right, production right. versus heat stuff. Right, right, exactly. Well, well the thing is, there, there hasn't been a coherent policy that's been adopted. Okay, that's why we see um, a type of scrambling uh, that's going on. Okay, we see uh, announcements of, of like Chef's one, for instance, the largest solar plant, uh, solar plant in the world. Country solar power okay, to be built here in Abu Dhabi. And then we also see nuclear power plants, okay, and then we start to see uh, LNG import. Okay, I mean, so there, there, there hasn't been a comprehensive strategy that's developed. So that's why you can still have announcements of major uh, you know, industrial projects, and the, 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 the ongoing products, the current projects, even don't have enough feedstock or they're experiencing difficulty in obtaining feedstock. Okay, so there simply has not been uh, an overall coherent strategy that has been created. So that's, I think that's the main problem, so that's why. So the left hand is the industry talking to the right hand.
I've got a very good question. We could all be shortages. I mean, the carbon trading platform could never catch up with the shortages. We could have the shortages by 2015, right? Yes. Even more. They'll just add and add and add and add. Mm -hmm. By the time you've changed the mindset, by the time you've collected data, which is difficult enough as it is, and, yeah, I mean, you know, you could have to be fast. I mean, yes. you're just saying, how long is it going to implement the system? Have a couple of years to find out who's emitting what, etc., etc. Well, what I think is 20 years. Uh, yeah, so well, you can get even to a basic. Yes, 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 yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, this would be for the long term. This is for the long term. In, in the interim, it's they're. Not a basic, no, no, no. In the interim, they're, they're going to have to import natural gas in the interim. They're, they're going to have to. They're going to have to import major quantities of LNG or burn fuel, uh, fuel oil. Uh, that, that, that's what they're going to have to do because. Uh, uh, then the shortages are only going to uh, continue. Or go nuclear. Or go nuclear. But I mean, nuclear by time you go by time. Okay. I, even in advanced countries that have experience with setting up nuclear power plants, okay, look at all the delays, cancellations, and cost, cost overruns, even with countries that had decades of experience. Okay, like in the U.S., for instance, we had in the 1980s, uh, there were uh, so many plant cancellations, nuclear plant cancellations, okay, and, and because of cost overruns and what have you. So when they say that nuclear power plant is going to be up by 2019, okay, so well, 2017, yes, yes, 2017, and perhaps 2019 at a later date. But um, and six, I think, what six power plants at that time? No, no, no. I mean, I, uh, any place in the world that has constructed nuclear power plants has always had delays. It's a 10-year cycle. Right. Roughly speaking, for mm -hmm. a nuclear power plant. Right. Under, under good circumstances. Right. Under good circumstances, you're sure, like the stars yeah. are aligned. Under good circumstances. Right. And what have you. So, uh, right. And that only covers your baseline. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, I mean, this isn't going to save them in, in the short term. No, it, it's not. I'd be the first one to say that. It would start now. How long would it take to just get, get to the first phase where you can actually implement a cap? Because you can't implement a cap okay. before you found all the baseline. Okay, okay, so you're saying when would you be able to implement the voluntary? Yeah, let's say they decide right? tomorrow, we decide tomorrow, okay. you know, tomorrow. that's what we're going to do it. Okay, then I would, say, I would say by 2015. 2015? Yes, 2015. You would start with the first phase. Yes. You saw the first phase. Yes, yes. Just to do the first phase, yeah, yes. to implement that. Yes, cap. 2015. And then, we need another five, seven years yes. to do to get the model phase of the two, to get everyone to yes. implement the technology, blah, blah, blah. Yes. And then phase three is to find the trade, right? Yes. No, 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 no. no and it's setting the targets. And no, no, ambitious, more ambitious and strategic. Ambitious targets. Right, okay. right. So tightening the cap. Phase three tightening the cap. Tightening the cap. I mean, I would say for each phase, I am saying about five to seven years for each phase. Okay. Okay. So like 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. Okay. It sounds like a long time. Yeah, it is a long time. Yeah, no, but, yeah. but I guess, you know, to argue from a more positive point of view, you could say that if it was really credible that this thing is coming. Even before there's any scheme in place, at least if people are thinking about it, that already has some effect on the decision and people, and that might, might, you know, people will be more efficient and so on. Yeah, yeah, it's it's not not the the mindset here is right, but uh, from the consumer. Uh, uh, yeah, otherwise, I take your point. If you believe that only when the scheme actually really takes effect, you know, that actually you start seeing savings, and yeah, it's, it's, it's too far away. I, I, to be but also, a thing too that we have to consider is that this industrialization is relatively new in the region. It's relatively new. It's only about the past that, you know, we can say 1973, but there's really intense industrialization, let's say over the past two decades. Okay, so I mean, if you look at a time frame at a minimum of 15 years, you create a workable carbon trading platform. And I think that's uh, entirely feasible within this region. And then it would at least get them in a mindset when they plan future uh, industrial projects and what have you, okay, uh, how to plan this out accordingly, uh, considering the fact that there are going to be carbon regulations. Okay, and the region's only going to continue to industrialize. Okay, so that's why I think that this is important. Okay, even though we're looking at a timeline at a minimum of about 15 years at a minimum. It's actually not super complicated. Mm -hmm. The people the big emitters. Yes. You know, the, the number of them is relatively limited. As you say, most of them are not owned. Yes, yes. It's not like Europe or the US or right. the whole century of many, many different kinds of sources. It, exactly, it's exactly. Administratively, it's relatively straightforward. Right, right, exactly. And, and actually, that's why I argue. I think that you should start with the big ones, and that would be relatively easy. I mean, they're under the patronage of, obviously, the, the, the rulers. I mean, so it'd be relatively easy to get them to come on board, even though they form a relatively effective uh, or uh, influential group. Okay, at the same time, they still have to take the marching orders uh, from the rulers. I also should mitigate against the, uh, the carbon leakage issue, because even if you don't have a coordinated GCC scheme, 
because of the government involved, involvement in a lot of these, like the largest emitters, people are not just going to pack and leave because you know, they're, they're not going to go anywhere. Right, right, right. Well, at least for the SOEs. I mean, yeah. for, right, if, if you take like, uh, you know, if you take uh, some type of Ford, uh, you know, the smelting company, it, it's a possibility that it could be located to another company, but they do it collectively. Yeah. Because those are always, we're always a JV between the private yes, and the absolutely. 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 Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. absolutely. Yes. No. Absolutely. Okay. Well, any other questions? Okay, great. Well,